Hey there, Parker X listeners. This is Brett Wood coming at you with the first episode of 2021 after a little bit of a winter hiatus. Today we're talking with Diana Alarcon, Director of Transportation Planning for the City of Tucson, and I hope you can keep up with her. She's one of the hardest working people I know in the business. Today we'll be talking about her arrival in Tucson and all the work she's done pre-pandemic, including mobility planning and helping to adapt the community's transportation system, and then how we've adapted to COVID in Tucson, including the implementation of things like slow streets to benefit residential neighborhoods, curb management to help support businesses, and building back transit for a post-COVID environment. Hope you enjoy. So, hey, uh, welcome back, Parker X listeners. I'm here today with Diana Alarcon, the Director of Transportation Planning for the City of Tucson, uh, over mobility, transportation planning, parking, anything that moves in the city, she's over it. Hey, Diana, thanks for being here with us today. Hey, Brett. Yeah. Thank you so, for having me. <laughs> um, these, these are all fun doing these kind of socially distanced, but we're, uh, we're adapting and, and, and surviving. So right. I just wanted to start with, um, you know, we're kind of focusing this this spring's episodes on kind of how COVID has impacted cities and campuses and, and more so how you're adapting in 2021 and evolving. So uh, first, I just start with you, you're relatively new to the city of Tucson. How long have mm-hmm. you been there? About two and a half years now. So, okay. yeah, it's been so, quite an adventure and even through a pandemic. Right. So about a, a year and a half pre-pandemic and then about a year of pandemic. And in that first year and a half, I mean, y'all accomplished quite a bit in terms of kind of moving Tucson forward. What kind of things were you doing when you hit the ground there? So, you know, um, you know, it's, I just want to back up for a minute. You know, one of the things people ask me is, why did you come to Tucson? And I would always say, you know, um, and this is my tagline is I'm an H. I love HGTV. I love watching, especially when they tear it down and rebuild it and all the neat stuff that they do and stuff. And so, and you always hear good bones, good bones and all of these different TV shows on HGTV. And, you know, when I came here to Tucson, I saw those great bones in this city of, that was working toward building a multimodal city. And so um, it was really exciting to come in and be able to pick up what's already started and kind of help move them or catapult them into moving along a little bit quicker than it has been. And so that's really been what we've done. So we put together a um, a planning um, that we're calling Move Tucson, which we're wrapping up, which is really exciting. And we're calling that our 20 year plan for a sustainable transportation system that looks at all the modes. So it looks at how pedestrians move, how the bikes move, how cars move, how our freight moves. Because, you know, city of Tucson is a huge uh, transportation um, community um, through trucks and freights um, uh, because we're so close to Mexico. We do a lot of commerce with them. We get a lot of commerce from the port of um, um, Los Angeles. We have our own port of Tucson here. And so it's a huge economic engine for our city. So it's really important that we also keep a pulse on that as well. And we also have a streetcar that got installed that really kind of revitalized our whole downtown core. But, you know, how do we take that streetcar and build it into it becoming part of our transportation system? And so that's been a really big focus. We've also put together and um, um, finished a complete street, um, um, uh, had our mayor and council approve a complete street guidelines and principles for us that we're actually moving into our design manual, that we're finalizing our design manual that will actually kind of be our guideline of how we build out the streets that's gonna focus in on our Move Tucson initiative. 
Um, so we're really excited. We're wrapping up Move Tucson now. That's going to, like I said, that's going to be our roadmap, every pun intended, of how we're going to build out the sustainable transportation system for the city. So that's been a great, uh, a lot of fun and some great successes. And, you know, I got to give kudos to the staff here. They're just amazing people. They have this great passion, you know, so where I came from, I was trying to bring in passion and build that so we could have and look at what that sustainable transportation system. I get here and I think going back to those great bones, you know, staff was here, their passion was here. They're, you know, they're, they're so dedicated and they see it and they, and they want to help grow it and expand it. So it's really exciting. And, you know, and we have a community that's very much behind it. And so that conversation that we're having as a community about what that looks like is also part of it. And, you know, parking plays a very important role in that. And so, you know, pre-pandemic, you know, parking was, it was, a, it was a very vital to the, restora to the revitalization of downtown. So it wasn't just about the streetcar, but also the parking, because a lot of folks, you know, the streetcar is actually a four mile circular. It's really driven the downtown. But it's also something fun. So if you're coming from the outside regions in, it's exciting. So our on-street and off-street parking, you know, had its own set of challenges and how we grow and develop it. And then as we talk about moving into other modes, is there really a need? And now with pandemic, we really got to talk about how parking works and, you know, what's the right move and what makes sense. I've been watching a lot of webinars on, you know, and participating in them. And it's very interesting to hear, you know, the industry, not just parking industry, but the industry as a whole is saying, yeah, I only see about 40% of my, of my crew coming back to the work, to the work office. And telecommuting is our new way of doing business. And so you have to think about that. So what does that translate to in your downtown core? What does that translate in your city? Um, since, you know, in what I'm responsible for now, it's not just the parking side of it, but I have the transit side of it. I'm responsible for the traffic lights, the traffic engineering. We do all the planning here. You know, I, I encompass all of that. And so how does that all work together now in this new world um, that we're living in? And what does that mean moving forward? And so as scary as it is, because the no new norm has changed, it's also really exciting because now we can really be innovative and, and progressive thinking and how we're going to utilize our streets and what that means to look and feel like for um, our community as a whole. So I have to apologize ahead of time, um, Brett, because I have a puppy and he just brought me a squeaky toy. <laughs> it's 2021. You don't have to apologize for dogs. Yeah. So that's, anymore. that's what you're, yeah. that's what you're hearing right now. And he just dropped it at my feet because he wants me to play. So I'm going to bend over and toss it. So just give me one second. That's, that's fine. I, I will say, I agree with you. I think, uh, you know, Tucson has always been kind of a diamond in the rough. When you think Arizona, it's always been Phoenix. I, and I lived out there for a long time, but I have some really great friends that live in Tucson and you do have like all the ingredients to make a great transportation city. Right. And what's fascinating to me is you're right. There's a lot of new normal. There's a lot of, of things that are going to change, but I think it's those cities that have, you know, a town gown environment with a great academic university destination yep. areas that that draw people in beyond just the the student crowd but also families and whatnot and and the right transportation mix that's going to help them really propel forward yeah. and you have all those things and, yeah. and lucky for you in the year and a half leading up to all of this you were putting all of those ingredients together in in, in your mobility planning and right so, Quick, quick we question. haven't stopped, but we did get a little sidetracked, yeah. but they were good sidetracks. So, you know, during the pandemic, you know, when, you know, the city of Tucson, our mayor was very, um, very progressive and very, I want to say aggressive about trying to, you know, drop the curve. As we would say here, we want to, we want to bend that curve back down. Um, we did not want, you know, we, she really put out there to try to stop the spread of the virus. And we were really successful that. So when June and July hit last year, when most cities were really starting to experience the worst of it, we were actually in a good place. Now we did, we did fall back a little bit, unfortunately, we all but did. she put in a declaration of emergency immediately. And we went directly to sending everybody to work from home. And so now we, that's became our new normal. So by the end of March, the entire city, a lot of the, the, not just city staff, but a lot of the businesses in city, they were shut down. 
we closed down because we were going to stop the spread of this pandemic in the city. And it was a very, uh, it was a very um, aggressive move because it's hard to shut businesses down. Yeah. But it did work. You know, we went through the summer with a low number of spread cases of spread. We also kind of did flatten the curve out there with people being contracting COVID or even, you know, the number of deaths that we had. But unfortunately, as you got back into the fall and into the holidays and school returned, we unfortunately did see a spike. And then over the holidays, we pretty much followed what the rest of the country did. Um, but now we're seeing a drop back, which we're really excited. So some of the challenges that actually came to us was, hey, since we all have to stay home and we, how can we use our streets better? You know, so I always would go visit folks and say, okay, let's talk about extending your front porch to the street. So there was this trend going around, which was really great. And we uh, dug into it right away called slow streets. And it was really about how can we design these streets so those folks that are driving are slowing down. And I, I do want to share, it was really sad. I sat in on a, um, on a webinar uh, last week with the National Highway Administration that shared that, you know, nationally what happened during the pandemic because so many people stopped driving, the roads opened up. So what they saw was an increase in number of crashes that occurred on all the streets throughout the nation. And that also led because what was happening with the streets being open and the crashes occurring, people were comfortable enough, they were speeding. Oh yeah, yeah. And then the other big right. issue that was registered with the National Highway Administration was actually uh, being under the influence. So for all those out there that are actually seeing this, if you do go out and you're meeting with family and friends and you have too much, spend the night or use Uber and Lyft or a taxi. Please don't get behind the wheel and drive. We do not want your life in danger and we do not want someone else's life in danger. That's right, that's right. And that's so right. I just got to share that because we here in Tucson also saw a major increase in number of crashes that led to fatalities on our roadways. So it's really important that as a community, we be mindful. So we wanted to slow the streets down so people could put their kids out there because parents were going crazy with their kids being home from school. <laughs> <laughs> well, my kids are grown, so I, I didn't have to deal with that, but I can appreciate that. Um, but we wanted to give them that extra room. So we sort of took this national move that was going on in a lot of other cities and explored Slope Street and said, okay, what does, that, what does that mean for our city? And so we actually put together a Slow Street program. We also received CARES dollars through the federal government. And our mayor and council actually gave us money to implement Slow Street. So we took it one step further. Not only were we going out there and, and putting signs up and barricades and stuff to create these traffic mitigations on a temporary basis, but we also then took dollars and went back out to the community and made those permanent improvements. So my staff went through and we actually changed the dynamics of a community of 18 of our neighborhood communities with permanent changes to traffic mitigation to slow the streets down on a permanent basis. So we have it temporary, but we also did it permanently. So we were really excited and we wouldn't have been able to do that without the CARES dollars, but our mayor and council gave us 1.4 million and we had until December 31st to spend it and we did it. And we have been able to have this really great impact to the community that they can actually take their streets back. So it's really cool. They're holding what they call porch concerts. So they're having these concerts out on lawns and people are putting their chairs in the streets and they can barricade it off. We wrote programs up that allow them to do it with really easy traffic control um, as part of it. We also, um, they the kids, it's, it's really cool to go through some of these neighborhoods and see the kids outside playing soccer and football. And you know, Tucson has amazing weather so we are really fortunate out here that we don't have as much rain as some other parts of the states. Um, and so kids are out, they're playing and they're, they're running off that extra energy that they usually get to do at school. They're able to do not just in their front yard, but on their streets. So it's, a, it's been a really exciting project and it's worked great. Um, and we're really grateful that our mayor and council gave us these dollars because not many cities had that opportunity, but we did. And we took and we spent 1.4 million in six months. It's interesting because I mean, you and I talked about this over the summer uh, for some of the work I'm doing with IPMI about mm -hmm. you know, the temporary side of things. I'm, I'm so excited to hear that it's permanent. 
Um, you know, the big thing that I, neighborhoods. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the residents have to love it. I mean, you're, you're oh, moving they do. fast traffic off their streets and creating more real estate for life, which is great. Yes. So when you say and, it's permanent, I mean, what, what are you doing to make it permanent? Are you, are you uh, actually putting traffic calming measures? Yeah, we actually did like, we would go in and do traffic circles or build out the curbs, reduce the radius so the cars had no choice to slow down. Um, chicane. So we did uh, speed humps too, um, you know, in the neighborhoods where it, we didn't have a direct pathway for a fire station or something, we could do some speed humps that would help. Um, so a lot of these went in and, and it's made a huge difference. And, and, and the cool thing is in roundabouts, we also, in a couple of them, we were able to build in some green stormwater infrastructure here. So the one thing about Tucson is because it does not rain very much, we average only seven inches on an annual basis in rain, which in some states you can get that in one day. We really don't have a stormwater system built. The water is built to run along the roads or along the side or in the, or on, um, or in the um, swell area. And so when it rains here, our roads are really compacted. So we had to um, think about building in some of these, you know, traffic circles that we went in, how we can build in some green storm water infrastructure to get the water off the road and feed our, our desert environment. And we had some success stories with that. I mean, one of them, we had this one, just real quick, Brad, and I know this is a little bit long winded, but we had this one intersection that was just, it was a three point intersection. And it was just, it was kind of like a, like a long, odd shaped oval, I want to say. But we got in there and we shaped a roundabout to fit the intersection. And then the neighborhood said, we don't want you to fill it in. Just leave it the dirt. We'll get in there. The neighborhood got in there. We partnered with another organization that we have in our city, which is a great partner. It's called Tucson Clean and Beautiful. And that's what they do. They are into beautifying it through landscaping. So we partnered up. We got the neighborhood hooked up with them. They got a grant from Tucson Clean and Beautiful. They came in. We got in there and cleaned out all that collegiate dirt, you know, because that's kind of the challenge here in Tucson. We have about five feet of this collegiate dirt and nothing can drain through it. But you get that up and you get to the good soil. You got great, you know, water that can go down, get to our aquifers, refurbish. I mean, and so we got in there, dug out five feet of collegiate dirt, put down good soil, did native plants. Just this beautiful, beautiful circle now that actually acts and is, you know, the water when it does rain gets fed. The native plants are growing, prospering. We put cactus and stuff. So they have not only this, this new traffic mitigation, but they have this landscaping that's also helped beautify their neighborhood. And then they've taken on the responsibility of maintaining it. They're so proud of what it did. That's and awesome. so, you know, yeah, it's really awesome. So, you know, a lot of really cool things came out of slow streets. Now, we're still doing slow streets. We, because it was so successful. I mean, when we put this out to the community, we got over 130 applications, but we could only do 18 neighborhoods because we dedicated $50,000 to each one of the neighborhoods, but for the improvements, but then you have the program yourself that you run to understand what the program, what the improvements need to be. And then once we we got that done and did all the analysis and everything, then we had 50 million to actually make the improvements. And I did run over in a few um, on some neighborhoods <laughs> because it's just, that's always the challenge that it is. But, you know, the neighborhoods were very engaged. We, uh, we started a program called Street a Block. Block. We got a grant from People for Bike, which I actually have their shirt on today. Um, and they gave us a $10,000 grant that we added on to this that allowed us to get what we call block leaders. So we actually went out and got block leaders who were invested in their community, went out and talked to their neighbors, got them invested. So it really became about everybody in the neighborhood and these great conversations. It was amazing and it was a ton of fun, but we only touched 18 neighborhoods, but we got over 130 applications. And when what we did do, we started getting a lot more requests. So we're actually have built this program and we're going to continue the program and we're going to do four a year. And so every quarter we're going to do a complete, we're going to do a slow street initiative and a community and make those permanent improvements to move them along. So, you know, it's just that there's something that came out of a pandemic, kind of created more of a li what we call living streets, right? You know, that's been a term that's been used throughout the country. Um, and we've created these great living streets and these great opportunities 
And it's just fun. And people now realize, hey, I don't have to use it just for a cough. It can be used for other things. And we've put in mitigations to slow people down so that um, it's safe for people to be out on the street. So it's just been a ton of fun, a lot of work, but a ton of fun. It's interesting. And for those that have never really looked at a map of Tucson or Arizona streets, I mean, a traffic engineer designed the cities. They're built in perfect grids. And so you can go fast anywhere through neighborhoods, through wherever. So the concept of just doing a little bit of traffic calming and moving people to the streets that they need to go to is, is, is exceptional. And that the yeah. neighborhoods have jumped on this. I hope more communities do that. I mean, it sounds like you spent a lot of money, but for 18 neighborhoods, it really wasn't that much money mm -mm. for the benefit that they're going to get. It's, it's incredible. So yeah, because yeah, because the other side of the cares dollars that really kind of falls into the parking is uh, we also, you know, one of the challenges coming out of the pandemic, you know, is uh, the re hotels, restaurants, these, these downtown comp um, businesses had to open back up under different stringent practices. And so what we found is the social distancing did not make it viable for businesses to even consider reopening because they couldn't get enough customers in there to actually pay for you know, the daily cost of running right. the business. So we really pushed an outdoor dining concept um, and we took some of the CARES dollars that the council gave us and we actually bought barricades and we bought ADA ramps and we actually um, moved forward. Our mayor and council allowed us to go to no charge of parking. So. If a restaurant or even our ice cream shop, we have this great local ice cream shop downtown, wanted to expand into the streets, they could come and get the barricades from us and we put them in the parking spaces. We would actually allow them to use the sidewalk so it's adjacent to the property, to the restaurant, so it's more of an extension of the building. And we kind of created the sidewalks in the parking spaces. And so, um, and we're doing that temporary. And then now we've actually are putting together a parklet ordinance that they will be able to follow when we're out of the state of emergency and come back and do a more permanent, but on a temporary basis, we've got these ADA ramps, so we're meeting federal guidelines. We've moved the on street, we removed the on street parking, created these walk sidewalks and allowed the restaurants and the retail spaces to expand, expand out on the street so that it made business sense for them to reopen. And that was another really good success story of how we got our, sorry about that, that's a, <laughs> how we got our businesses back up and running. Sorry about that, Brett. Um, why is it when you get on a, on a call, they, they just get feel neglected, call? man. My dog yeah, comes up here um, and, and, and so, so, you know, that's another one of our successes. So, you know, we're having that conversation about best use of the curb and, you know, before the pandemic, we were actually going to start a curb management study and we had to put it on hold. But now we're re we're up, we, we reopened it back up. We're getting that study back up and moving because we we now's the time we really should be having a conversation about what is that best use use of the curb downtown and where is it we should have the parking and how should that look and feel? And you know, and we gotta also keep in consideration, you know, how does how does the TNCs, the Ubers and the lifts and the taxi fit into this? And, you know, and then this leads us even to a better question and that we're having here in our city is, you know, as we talk about that first and last mile and the use of the curb, where do we want to put mobility hubs where we can kind of pull all of this together? What makes the most sense? Because we're, we're changing how we're moving transit. Everybody in the country saw a huge drop in transit use when this COVID went into the pandemic, that, when, it, when the pandemic actually became a conversation, you know. We saw our paratransit drop by 80%. We're only back up to where um, we're only back up to about 40% of the capacity we were a year ago. So it's not even coming back at the level that you know we anticipate. We do expect it to come back up some more once the pandemic is over and a majority of the community is vaccine. We do see that increasing back up because those those are very vulnerable folks, and we see them actually kind of getting getting back into their old routines and are using that service. So we do expect it. I don't ever expect it to return to 100%. No, I agree, yeah. Um, we, um, our streetcar um, took a dive as well, you know, because the U of A is a huge contributor to the ridership of our streetcar and they took their students to online last yep. spring. 
last fall. And then this spring, they brought some of the students back. So we saw a drop. Now we're seeing an increase. We're happy about that. But they're still only at 40% capacity on campus. So until that world comes back, we're going to see a drop in the ridership uh, with that. Um, and then our transit operation took a 60% dive. Now I'm happy to say our transit is actually back up to where we're in the teens. So one day it'll be 17, the next day it'll be 19, maybe it'll be 11, something along that line. So we've seen that changes, but we've changed our transit operations, um, Brett. We've gone to where we've moved to an on-demand. We took some of our low rider ships before pandemic, redesigned them so they're only on the arterials and then created areas and put on-demand service in there. And that's been a boom. So we're thinking now completely different about how we treat transit. From the from the buses to to the paratransit, yeah. And how does that fit and connect with your downtown businesses and your community? And you know, it's it's all new, and it's almost like you just need to blow it all up and start all over again. Um, and that's a that's another exciting conversation that we're having right now. Well, I mean, I think again, the interesting thing is, is you were in the process of really evolving and molding this program, and we've all had to pivot quite a bit because of yeah. because of COVID, but you're at a place where pivoting seems like it's pretty easy. So, yeah. um, so I mean, I, I hate to ask this because I mean, you're doing so much, but what what's next? I mean, you know, all the stuff you're, what, what do you think is going to happen next after we start returning to some new normalcy? So um, I, you know, uh, I, what's next, I think for us is, you know, finishing up our mobility master plan, which is move Tucson. And then how do we create a funding dedicate a dedicated funding program to build that so that we can actually continue to expand these, some of these great initiatives that we're doing and how does that look and feel. And then, you know, there's a lot of work with transit. I mean, it took a lot to make that one move and create that just that on, one on demand. And then so now let's take transit and let's look about it. So. I, when I say blow up transit, and I think that's where a lot of the dedication over the next year is going to go, um, is because we're never going to get ridership back up. It's never going to return, not in any city. It's just, it's not going to return. What the pandemic did do is it gave us all a scare to kind of be in a social setting, in a tight social setting. Um, and even though right now the federal government has passed mandates to wear a mask and um, you can't get on a bus unless you have a mask, you know, there's a lot of strict rules now that we're required by FTA and TSA to follow. There's still going to be a nervous, so sorry, a concern, an issue. Um, in a minute, at the end, I'll pick up the dog so y'all can see the puppy. Um, there's going to be this concern always. So I think we have to think about, you know, what is transit really going to be and how does it serve? Um, we've actually been fare box free since last April or June. I'm sorry, June. Last June, our mayor and council said, go fare box free, Diana. Because we were very fortunate to receive dollars through the FTA as part of the CARES um, funding that came down. So we had some dollars that we could go fare box free and cover our operational cost. And another thing that we were able to do because of that is we, oh, we're gonna go out? No, we're good, we're good. Oh, okay. Yeah. The other thing that we were able to include was um, we were not in the position where we really had to look at killing some services. A lot of cities across the nation cut their service, boom, 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 which affected the most vulnerable users of your transit system. And we haven't had to do that. We've been fortunate to be able to maintain the service levels that we had so that we could continue to provide that service to those most vulnerable users. And we've been able to have it fare box free. So we've had some really good wins and we've had a lot of good lessons learned over the COVID period. Okay, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let everybody see you in a minute. Um, we, we've had a lot of great lessons learned and we're gonna have to take those lessons now and start applying them. So I think our focus over the next year is transit, how it fits into mobility. Um, and then that last and first mile connection is gonna be a really important part of our conversation. And I really think that's going to be our focus over the next year. And then just getting the action plan put together to move, move Tucson forward. That's, that's excellent. Well, I will say, I think Tucson is in good hands with you and your <laughs> staff you and your it. team. Uh, it's very impressive. I will also say this is probably the easiest interview I ever did because you answered all of my questions before I could ask them. So 
I had it on the tip of my tongue and you would answer it. So uh, kudos. Well, Diana, thank you so much. And you're uh, welcome. Let's Here, see let the me dog. show you. Let me show you the puppy. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Now he wants. Now he's hiding from me. <laughs> so this is this is my puppy. Oh this goodness. Is Chato. Is that a, a Schnauzer? No, a Scottish Terrier. Scottish Terrier. Okay. Yeah, this is Chato. How old is he? He's a year. Wow, he's he's a big boy. Yeah, he's twenty one pounds. Nice. But he he's been a lifeline for me. Well, so, good. So you know he's been my he's he has been because I had to, you know I I was ill. And I had to go and hibernate and I literally could not go in and out of my house. And so this little boy and I became attached at the hip. So when I do have to go back to work, we're both going to have separation anxiety. <laughs> or you're going to have to take him to work with you. So Yeah, you know. I'm trying to get him trained so he'll behave when we're at work. But you can see what he does at home. We're throwing That's toys. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Well, Diana, I appreciate your time today. And uh, I hope everybody enjoys this conversation. And best of luck to the city of Tucson as y'all move forward. I appreciate it. Good talking with you, Brett. Take care. Stay safe. Yep. Thank you for listening to the Parker X podcast. We sincerely appreciate it and hope you are enjoying our content. Please remember to rate, review, comment, subscribe, and share. And follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. The following has been a production of Parker X.